ho, ho. The NRA has got to go. My name is Christopher Underwood, and I'm an My name is Shanae Johnson. My name is Antonio Maria Jaya. I'm 34 years old. I was at Virginia Tech in 2007 when. Uh, we experienced the nation's largest mass shooting. This year will make it six years since my 14-year-old brother, Akio Christopher, was shot while walking home from a high school graduation party at his friend's house. My son, Kedrick Ali Marl Jr., was murdered at the age of 17. Five years ago, on July 5th, 2013, I was walking down the street towards the subway when a man started shooting at a pregnant woman. Akil was my best friend. He looked out for me. On June 27th, 2012, When I think about my brother, I think about all he didn't get to accomplish, such as graduating high school, going to college, getting married, having children, even the opportunity to vote. This will never be accomplished. Today, we marched across the Brooklyn Bridge for our lives. But, how, but I have been marching and speaking out on this is, issue since I was five. I am angry and I say to Mr. President and Congress members, it's not my job to protect you, it's your job to protect us. Graduation. He was just one month away from his graduation. He had received a academic scholarship to St. John's University. And so Kendrick decided that, you know, he was going to go shopping and spend the night at his friend's house. Um, so I believe, from what I've been told, was later on that even, evening, Kendrick and a bunch of his friends decided to go to a graduation party, as all children do. Um, they went to the party with young people their age. An older group of kids, well not even kids because they were over 21, came into the party, started beating everyone up, bullying everybody. Kedrick got the people, well the girls in particular that came with, the girls in particular that came with Kedrick, he got them out of the way, like he took them out of the party, went a block away to get the girls to safety, two of his female friends. But he remembered that his other friend was still at the party. So Kedrick went back to get his friend, and when Kedrick went back to get his friend, that's when my son uh, was shot. And I was shot in the chest. I actually went into a coma for four days, and I was just in the ICU for another couple of days, and then I was in the hospital for another week. When I got out of it, I had a hospital bill for about $120,000. I needed another $40,000 to survive on, and the entire experience took about 17 months of recovery to get over. But what people don't talk about is that day I wasn't the only victim. There were many other people who were affected. There were the little children who were walking across the street with me. There was the elderly man who was behind me, and there were also the people in that neighborhood. And they all were practically shot along with me that day. We have lost more young people in school shootings than we've lost military personnel at war.
I've been doing lockdown drills since kindergarten, but I had never really processed what it was about. How many innocent babies have to lie in their own blood from bullet wounds before Congress makes a change? How many school shootings have to occur for gun laws to change? When will enough be enough for elected officials to speak up and take action instead of taking the NRA's money? When the Constitution was written, when the Bill of Rights was written, there was great concern that an executive branch might turn into royalty. There was the ability to take over a government and change a society by using muskets. Today, even if you have the, you're the greatest gun collector in the world, you have the greatest militia out in the countryside, you can't take on the United States government. It's a myth. And you can't protect yourself. Owning a gun makes you more likely to be killed than not owning a gun. Why do we think it is exceptional, good, and an important tradition to give Americans the ability to kill each other in great numbers and kill themselves in great numbers? Why is that a right that is inalienable? first gun control laws that I know of anyway, and I think they were the first, were in the 1930s. The 1930s mobsters, as you know from your Elliott Ness films, were using Tommy guns and automatic weapons. And Automatic weapons were doing far too well against the authorities, so the Congress took action. In 1938, they outlawed automatic weapons. And that is one of the few laws that was put into place that remains today. In the late 1960s, um, we think of a lot of violence in society in terms of generalized rioting and violence, like the riots in Watts, like the riots in Detroit. Um, we also think of the assassinations. So in 1968, the best gun laws this country has ever had were passed, but it wasn't really the assassinations that did it. It was much more so black activists, like the Black Panthers particularly, realizing they had a right to own arms and they had a right to own semi-automatic arms. So they have a famous, there's a famous photo on the courthouse steps of Oakland where the Black Panthers are standing there in their black berets with their semi-automatic weapons. And that scared a lot of people. So the majority at that time in the Congress said, okay, we better put some gun laws in place. But that deteriorated over time. My name is Howie Stern. I'm a federal agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, which is commonly referred to as ATF, under the United States Department of Justice. I've been so for 28 years. And I was hired in 1990. I began in January 1991. Uh, well, we, it's predominantly two titles, uh, Title 18 of the United States Code and Title 26 of the United States Code. The Title 18 deals with the firearms that you would see run-of-the-mill, run so to speak. Handguns, pistols, uh, rifles, shotguns, uh, regulates what laws allow which individuals to have these firearms. Now Title 26 uh, is more unique. That is, deals with firearms you don't see often. Silencers, uh, destruction devices, sawed off shotguns, which just makes, basically means a shortened shotgun or a sawed off rifle, which means a, a shortened rifle. And silencers too, which uh, just like the word depicts, a silencer you can attach that to a, uh, the end of any firearm and it would 
decrease the volume of it. So those are illegal. Those have to be registered by law if an individual has one. And again, we don't see those all too often. But Title 18, we have a Section 922G. That, that means a prohibited person, a convicted felon, uh, someone who's an unlawful drug abuser, someone who's an order of protection against them, someone who's in the United States illegally, uh, someone who's been adjudicated mental, mental, have mental issues, that's five, this might be one or two more. Those are people that are just classified federally that are not allowed to uh, possess a firearm and what happens more often than not, it's convicted felons. If you've been convicted of a felony from here on in, the rest of your life you're not allowed to possess a firearm in the United States. Then we also have 922A1A, now we deal with that a lot. That deals with people that sell firearms without having a firearms license, which uh, most of street sales. As you know, in the United States, there are 50 states, and there are 50 different states, state laws. Now, some states are very easily to possess firearms, like Florida, Georgia, Texas, Pennsylvania, and then some states are uh, much more difficult, like New York State, very difficult to, to uh, possess a firearm. So what happens is individuals, illegal firearm traffickers, purchase firearms legally in those states, like Florida and Georgia, down south, and transport them to New York and sell them on the street for a very, very large profit. For instance, an $80 cheap firearm, a Brico firearm, could be sold in uh, New York for $400. Okay, section, uh, Title 18, Section 922K. As you might know, every firearm in the United States since 1960, 1968 is required to be identified by a serial number, a unique serial number, uh, letters, numbers, or a combination. Now, if a firearm is, uh, does not have a serial number, it's been obliterated or never possessed one in the first place, that's a violation of 922K. And then another big law that we concentrate that gives us a lot of work is Title 18, Section 924C which means it's illegal to carry a firearm in a narcotics transaction, in any kind of narcotics business. So we work a lot with the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, uh, you know, they'll, we work to join investigations on drug, drug dealers that possess firearms to protect their narcotics business. It, it happens very, very often where a drug dealer who's, you know, dealing in large amount of, amounts of narcotics would possess a firearm. So that would be a case investigation that we work jointly by DEA and ATF. There was one assassination attempt that, though not successful, did trigger a series of events that led to some of the modest gun control measures we have today. And that was the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan by John Hinckley. In that shooting outside a hotel, Ronald Reagan was grievously injured, which we didn't know in the moment, and James Brady, his press secretary, was shot through the head. and crippled for life. James and Sarah Brady were stalwart Republicans. When Jim got shot, things changed. They changed even more so when Sarah was driving their son Scott home and realized they themselves had a gun in their pickup truck. Sarah and Jim Brady started working on this issue and they were very credible because they were such Republicans. They were such conservative people. They were so part of the Washington establishment that nobody could say they had some liberal or leftist or unrealistic agenda. The Bradys had introduced a simple bill about background checks on guns. They wrote the bill, they started lobbying for the bill during the Reagan years, and it did not move. When President Clinton took office, it was still an iffy issue. But they pushed and they pushed, and finally in 1993, the first Brady Bill was passed and became the Brady Law. There are a couple of important loopholes that remain till today, the gun show loophole, um, financing for the national background check system, but at least there was a background check system. After Sandy Hook, uh, the governor put forth uh, a version of the SAFE Act, which really bans most assault weapons in New York. It was a very far-reaching bill. And credit to him and to my colleagues in the legislature who voted for it and sponsored it, as I did, we were able to get it done very quickly. We passed the bill 
at about three in the morning. It was not a perfect bill. It had things wrong with it. I felt very passionately and strongly it was the right thing to do. It didn't have to be perfect. It had to be take action, take action now. I'm proud that we did it. And I don't regret that we did it at three in the morning. If we passed a law here in New York State five years ago that does everything they're still talking about doing today. Ban assault weapons, no more than 10 bullets in a clip, and have a mental health database so mentally ill people can't buy guns. Common sense. We passed the SAFE Act and now we want to take it to the next step. If a parent knows or believes a child is exhibiting disturbing behavior and possibly violent behavior, the parent has the legal right to go to a judge to have a hearing to do a mental health evaluation on their child. The second part of the red flag bill says if a teacher believes a student is exhibiting dangerous behavior, give the teacher the right to go to a judge and ask for an evaluation. But give them the right to, to go to a judge to get a mental health evaluation before God forbid something happens.